I guess it's safe to say that Vero Beach, Florida is a contradiction in terms. On one side, you got white sandy beaches and all the good things that come with them. While on the other side, you got the foggy swamps with the mosquitoes, the blood-sucking leeches, and the gators, and all the bad things that come with them. And it was in this backwater town of Vero Beach in the early 1980s that a string of mysterious disappearances would occur, when the town would become known for more than just its sun, beaches, and swamps. It was on an early Tuesday afternoon when new best friends Lynn Elliott and Reagan Martin decided to go to the beach. The high school students only lived a couple of blocks from the waves and spent most days there. By all accounts, the location was known as Zero Beach because not a lot of people got around there during the week. But Lynn, her best friend, along with the two younger brothers, figured a day at the beach was in order. And the parents never worried about the kids. After all, they'd grown up there. But this day was different. When Lynn's father came home and asked his two sons where Lynn was, the oldest said that Lynn and Reagan said they were gonna go hitchhiking, despite his protests. The last time he saw them, they were standing at the side of the road with their thumbs out. It was later that afternoon, around 4.30, a teen on his bike returning from a friend's place witnessed what can only be described as a horrific occurrence. I heard this screaming and this man was chasing this young girl or lady. Then I saw him dragging her back towards the house and I heard two shots. When police received the call, they were told that a young blonde girl was running naked with her hands tied behind her back. She tripped and fallen, and a man walked up and shot her twice in the face. The Ling family had only recently moved to Vero Beach a year earlier from Taiwan and were part of a hard-working group of immigrants working to better themselves picking oranges in many of the local orchards in Florida. The family had adapted well to their new country with their 17-year-old daughter, Ingwa, being an honor student at the local high school. It was on a Thursday afternoon that Ingwa and her mother would vanish from the family home, disappearing like ghosts, fruit-picking ghosts. When cops went and checked out the house, it looked like the mother and daughter had been abducted by aliens. Cops said it was unsettling. Even the vacuum cleaner was still running. Purse, keys on the table. Heck, they hadn't even bothered to put on the shoes. And with no other house within a mile of either side of their home, there were no witnesses. And the orange-eating cops? They didn't have a clue. But they wouldn't be the first woman who'd go missing on their watch. <laughs> Judith K. Daly was raised in the area, but had since moved to California and started a family, but had returned with her two daughters to visit friends and family, and they decided to go to the beach and not wanting to cramp her daughters and their friend's style, she went for a walk on her own. There were no witnesses, and she was never seen again. Once again, the cops were baffled. It's a goddamn mystery. And although they contemplated warning the public, a warn them of what? There was no proof that anything had even happened. For all I knew, these women had just got up and walked away. And I want a crime.
David Allen Gore and Fred Waterfield were first cousins. Born and raised in Vero Beach, they were more like brothers, tighter than the Velcro strap on a cripple's boot. A year older than Waterfield, I guess he looked up to his older cousin, and they shared similar interests, similar perversions. They both enjoyed talking about Gore's mother and how attractive she was, and then jerking each other off, which I guess makes them jerk offs. And when they were teens, they had a menage a trois with Waterfield's younger sister, and it went by her choice. In school, they had a reputation for being troublemakers, all round losers. But no one paid, no much, never mind. Especially the girls. Both families were church going folk, and on the outside seemed normal. But behind the curtains, there were secrets. Like Gore's mother used to read the Bible to him, with him sitting on her lap only in her bra and panties, giving him a boner. And then she'd scold him for it, make him pray for forgiveness. But the cousin's bond tightened, I guess due to their mutual perversions. But due to these perversions, Gore got himself into trouble early in life. While working as an auxiliary pig for the local sheriff's department, he pulled over a teen, showing her his badge, saying there had been some break-ins in the area and he needed to take her in to idea. Driving her to a secluded area, he was spotted by a fisherman, a friend of the family. He recognized Gore. So Gore let the girl go, but it was too late. Word got back to the sheriff's department and he was fired. And although no charges were laid, he was now in the police department's sights. It was only a few months later that he and his cousin had abducted a teen and spit roasted her without her permission. But when she squawked, they said it was consensual and the charges were later dropped. When they weren't grifting, the two cousins could usually be found out in the Everglades hunting. And according to friends, they knew a million and one places where they could do anything they wanted out of the judgmental gaze of prying eyes. And by all accounts, they did. After missing the bus, the two 14-year-old best friends had double-dared each other to hitchhike to the beach. I miss the bus. I miss the bus. And that is something that I will never, ever, ever do again. Because unfortunately, they crossed paths with Gore and Waterfield. To this day, it has never been ascertained whether the deadly duo's encounters with their victims was random or they had been out hunting brought the Gore's place for a one-sided party and they were brutalized and murdered, cut up, and then disposed of in the swamp. When a 13-year-old teenager had phoned the cops and told them that he saw a naked girl running with her wrist tied, who was shot twice in the face. Cops didn't need to be told twice where to go. They already knew, because Gore had been on their radar for a long time now. They just couldn't link him to anything. After all, half these good old boys had gone to school with him. Three units arrived at Gore's house within 15 minutes of the call and waited for backup, with eventually 20 armed officers surrounding the house. They told Gore to leave the house. Unarmed, he refused. As cops moved closer to the house and surrounded it, one of them, who'd gone to school with Gore and once was a friend, tried to talk him down. But as he spoke to Gore and moved closer to an open door in the garage, he saw what he believed to be blood dripping from the back of a vehicle. And as they moved in, and they opened up that trunk. Inside was the naked body of 17-year-old Lynn Elliott. Now fed up and negotiating, they busted in the house and they found Gore in a crawl space in the ceiling. 
and tied up beside him, naked, was 14-year-old Reagan Martin. She was still alive. The girl was hysterical, and she told cops what had happened, and she told them that while Gore was raping her, her friend had escaped because they'd heard the front door shut. Gore went after her, and she'd heard gunshots. She also told them that Gore hadn't been working alone. He'd been with his cousin. But after they'd abducted the girls, the cousin saw his sister, he got spooked, and he left. And Cobbs knew exactly who she was talking about, because the cousins were inseparable. Fred Waterfield had been found at his auto repair shop, about half a mile from Gore's place. Reagan said that he'd been driving the vehicle when the girls were abducted, and he helped bring them into the house and put them in their room. When cops busted in on Fred Waterfield, he said to him, if that no good son of a bitch cousin of mine gets me in trouble, I'll kill him. Reagan Martin was able to identify both men from a police lineup. Only three bodies were ever found, and Gore helped the cops find them. I guess he figured it would help save himself, but it didn't. I had my wife by the hand we were squeezing very tightly and it was uh i never watched anybody die before but i it, it, it was it wasn't fun Public enemy number one.